Chapter 27 Faith and Force June 29, 2086 High Orbit over Proxima Centauri The battered warship Charlemagne emerged from hyperspace in a dimly lit region of space. A dull, faint red light filled the system, giving an observer the impression that the flotilla of starships were sailing between open flames. Down below, Proxima Centauri gave off weak light and was outshined by its neighbor, the twin stars at the core of Alpha Centauri. The smallest of the human warships, the Singaporean-flagged Vengeance, flew alongside the battleship and extended her docking port. As soon as the two vessels were docked, the damage control and repair teams moved across to the Charlemagne. Inez, Rafi, and Captain Mubarak guided each group to where the ship was damaged and set them to work. One crew was left slack-jawed after seeing the shattered remains of the hyperspace module. Good thing we got to you when we did, commented one of the repair workers. Did the Higarans do all of this? No, Rafi replied. We've got a few Grey Phoenix people on board. My teams are sweeping the ship for the rest. You should lock down the docking tunnel, just in case they're thinking about jumping ship. For her own part, Inez was not thinking about jumping ship, but she was not given a choice. She was in the hangar bay with Adam Barter and his crew when her mother arrived. Scarlet Freeman and her ISO escorts entered the hangar and approached Adam's transport ship, the Osiris. They entered without declaring their presence. Down in the Osiris's cargo hold, Inez, Adam, and the others were securing the stolen hyperspace core, having just finished an inspection to make sure it was still in working order. Scarlet and her team entered through a door on the bottom level of the cargo bay, looking up at Inez who was on a catwalk high above. I'm impressed, Scarlet said. You actually got the core. Looking down at her mother, Inez felt her throat go dry. Scarlet looked different from the last time Inez had seen her. She had a few bruises on her knuckles and face. Inez could also detect what felt like an aura of hostile energy coming from her mother. Scarlet was in a fight recently and should not be crossed today. Are we taking this thing to the atelier? Inez called down to Scarlet. Yes, Scarlet replied, but we're taking a detour first. Could you come down here? I need a word. Inez gulped and slowly moved to find a staircase. Just in her mother's tone of voice alone, she could tell this was going to be a very unpleasant conversation. Meanwhile, as Inez went off to meet Scarlet, Adam and his command crew went to the bridge of the Osiris and carried out their takeoff checklist. While Inez and her mother had their meeting, the Osiris lifted off and flew out of the Charlemagne's hangar, traveling the short distance to the cruiser Solaris and docking with her. When Inez met her mother below the hyperspace core, Scarlet did not say anything. Instead, she held out her hand. Inez paused to look at what her mother was holding. Oh, my ISO ID card, Inez said. I left it on Earth. Scarlet narrowed her eyes at Inez. Nezzy, she started to say. Don't call me that, Inez interrupted. Scarlet took a deep breath and started again. Nezzy, after you left Earth, I went to my important meeting, the one that got pushed up because of the Waldheim disaster. Do you know who was there, waiting for me? Inez shook her head. Varian Robinson and the other five so-called Stormbreakers. How did they get there? Scarlet's bluish-gray eyes locked onto Inez and held their gaze. Nezzy, how did they know where to find me? Inez took a step back as the full weight of the accusation hit her. Feeling defensive, she lashed out. Mom, what the hell? I've been off world for almost a month and we've been radio silent the whole time. What makes you think I was talking to anyone? Inez said. You've met Varian before. You traveled with him, Scarlet said. Inez lost her train of thought immediately. Wait, 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 
Varian's a guy? Both women stared at each other, momentarily distracted. You didn't know? Scarlet said. Surely you would have known when he told you his name. He kept that kind of stuff secret, Inez replied. How do you find out? Gene therapy records, Scarlet said. As soon as you gave me his name, I looked him up. He started the sex change process in 2083, and with each gene therapy appointment, he left behind one hell of a paper trail until he suddenly vanished off the face of the planet about a year later. His family hasn't been trying to find him, which suggests they know where he is. Makes sense for my Varian and yours to be the same person. You really don't know all of this? Inez could sense her mother's anger and suspicion was not going away. If anything, Scarlet was now viewing her daughter with even less trust. But before anything else could be said, there was a noisy lurch as Osiris docked with the Solaris. A hissing from a nearby pressure door signaled the arrival of a new person. Central Officer David Sepulveda stepped into the cargo deck and made his presence known. Director Freeman, we're all ready. Admiral Siajotso says the Secretary General has given his approval. We can go at any time. Thank you, Central, Scarlet said. We'll be along in a moment. Then she turned back to Inez. I'll be frank with you. I've got reason to suspect you're not entirely loyal to us, Nezzy. Tomorrow, I'll give you a chance to prove yourself. Show me you're really on our side. Inez was flustered. I brought you the hyperspace core, she protested. And I've done everything else you asked. What did I do wrong? Scarlet did not answer. She demanded Inez follow her out of the cargo bay and onto the deck of the Solaris. Inez had walked the halls of her new starship a few times before, but never while it was actually in space. The experience was slightly different, as she could feel the pulling sensation of the artificial gravity generator down below, and the distant thunder of the engines behind her. Crew members in the hallway stopped to salute Inez and her mother as they went by. The Solaris was still incomplete. Inez found scaffolding in the hallway, and some rooms were stripped bare. To her genuine alarm, Inez and Scarlet passed by several locations where ammunition for the mass drivers was being stored out in the open. High explosive shells were lined up on the floor, ready for someone to carry them to their appropriate guns. One of the magazines is not finished yet, a crewman explained. As they got near the bridge, Scarlet spoke. Over the past few weeks, we've been hit by a great number of setbacks and complications. To make matters worse, one of our allies has betrayed us. You mean those saboteurs on the Charlemagne? Inez asked. Rafi caught two of them. Scarlet raised an eyebrow. When she replied, Scarlet's voice was just a little softer. Thanks for telling me, she said. I'll make sure to follow up with Bakir after I show you to the bridge. The Solaris had a command deck, located on the top floor of a conning tower that stood high above the rest of the superstructure. From here, the bridge offered a commanding view over the entire ship and surrounding space. As soon as Inez and Scarlet stepped onto the bridge, an alarm sounded, followed by a series of flashing red lights. The rest of the bridge crew jumped with surprise as a computerized voice declared, Attention! Unauthorized presence detected! From the captain's chair, a familiar man stood up. Ugh, wait a moment, ladies. Give me a second, he said. Then he directed his voice to the ceiling. Computer, this is Central Officer Yaroslav Vlatsoyevich Dotsenko, United Nations Navy. Execute Echelon Protocol. At once, all of the red lights turned blue and the alarm silenced. A blue spotlight shone down on Inez, making her sweat. The computer voice said, Attention, Senior Command Exchange confirmed. Maria Madalena Inez Freeman Espinosa is the CO. Central Officer Dotsenko rose from the captain's chair and shook hands with Inez. 
Sorry, ma'am, he said. I wanted that to be a little more ceremonious, but you know how it goes. Anyway, you have the con. For the first time, Inez was fully in command of her own starship. But the moment was ruined by Scarlet's presence over her shoulder. You should get comfortable with being on the bridge, Scarlet said. Vice Admiral Vargas is on his way here to brief you on your part in tomorrow's operation. Scarlet put a hand on her daughter's shoulder. I've put a lot of trust in you, Nezzy, Scarlet whispered. I would hate to imagine what might happen between us if you let me down. About two hours later, Inez departed the bridge, having given the con back to Dotsenko. Scarlet also left the bridge. The two women parted ways in the hall. They both needed to make their own preparations for what was coming next. Inez waited until her mother was out of sight, and the instant she was certain she was alone, Inez darted into an empty room filled with construction materials and collapsed scaffolding. Pressing her back against the wall and curling up into the fetal position, Inez rocked back and forth, shaking. She had been told the full extent of her mother's plan. The United Nations had suffered a series of defeats and setbacks in rapid succession, both at home and in deep space. Scarlet had convinced UN leadership that it was time for a revenge attack, and the Solaris would be the tip of the spear. Tomorrow, Inez would take Solaris into enemy territory and fire the Divine Enforcer for the first time. She had been briefed on how it would happen and what the effects would be. Inez knew what was coming and it terrified her. Taking a few moments to collect herself, Inez stood up and walked quickly down to one of the lower levels. Cassandra was here. Inez knew she would be, since the Divine Enforcer could not be fired without her. The young girl was being held in one of the cargo bays, and she was under very heavy guard. Inez told the troops to buzz off, and as soon as they were gone, she made her way inside. There was nothing in the bay except for a table and a nondescript mattress. Out of sheer boredom, Cassandra was lying on her back in the middle of the floor and staring at the ceiling high above. At least she was until she spotted Inez. Cassandra sprang to her feet and ran across the cargo bay at full speed, hitting Inez with yet another one of her idiosyncratic flying tackle hugs. Nezzy! Cassandra cried. What's going on? Where are we? Inez sat down on the mattress and took a deep breath. She did not know where to start, but she had to start somewhere. Cassandra, do you know what's going to happen tomorrow? Well, it's your birthday, Cassandra said. But Dr. Spark said I needed to forget about stuff like that and just do what I'm told. Yeah, I heard something like that too, Inez said. Listen, Cass... Tomorrow, they're gonna make us fire the ship's big gun. Cassandra's face fell. Oh, so I have to go back in the machine. She sounded very glum. Yeah, Inez replied, hanging her head. The two sat in gloomy silence for a few moments. And then Inez asked, Why did my dad try to take you away from here in the first place? I mean... I think I know, but what did he tell you? Cassandra sniffed. Her voice wavered. The professor said that all of these people were bad people who wanted to do bad things. They were evil for making me do bad things with them. Inez let out a weak laugh. Today, I found out he was right, she said. Tomorrow, my mom's gonna make us do some really awful stuff and I don't see how we can get out of it. Not until we get back to Earth, anyway. What's on Earth? Cassandra asked. Friends, Inez replied. Folks who might help us. Inez took another deep breath. She knew she was taking a big risk by voicing this idea to a kid, 
but she would have felt awful if she did not at least extend the offer. Cass, remember when we made plans to go out to the beach for my birthday? Yeah, but we're totally not going to make it to Coca Beach now, Cassandra moaned. Well, let's say we go to the beach anyway, Inez said slowly. Then, when it's time to go back to Canaveral, we just don't. Cassandra looked at Inez. I hate Canaveral, she said. If you want to run away, you've got to take me with you. <laughs> That's the idea, Inez said with a soft laugh. We do this one god-awful thing for my mom, and we win her trust just long enough that she lets us out of her sight for ten minutes. Then we run, Cassandra finished, and we live in the wild like Mira and Jericho. <laughs> wait, 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 what? Where'd you learn about those two? Inez giggled. Books. You know, the ones in the Space Center library, Cassandra said. In the Stormbreakers, Mira had no family, and she was far from home. So she adopted Jericho, and they were mom and daughter together. And then they got separated by the Chosen Warlock and had to fight a whole war just to get back to each other. Inez laughed and pulled Cassandra into a hug, tousling the little girl's long black hair. Well, maybe I'll adopt you, Inez joked. Then I could be your mom. Ew, gross, no way, Cassandra shrieked playfully. Inez did not leave the cargo bay until she got Cassandra to swear herself to secrecy. The runaway plan was simple, but it would only work if Cassandra and Inez carried it out alone. With a final hug, Inez left the cargo bay, but she could have sworn that as she was leaving, she faintly heard Cassandra mutter to herself, Bye, Mom. Oh, yuck. That sounds gross. Never say that, never say that. All around the ship, people were making preparations for the jump to hyperspace. The stolen progenitor hyperspace core was being installed somewhere in the ship's hold, and workers were hastily placing even more high explosive ammo in the hallways so it could be used in battle tomorrow. On her way back to the bridge, Inez turned a corner and found two men working on an open electrical panel. The workers were so engrossed in their task that neither of them spotted Inez or acknowledged her approach. She could see the men were attaching an object to the electrical panel. Inez paused, about 30 feet away from the two men, and froze. Inez was young, her eyesight still sharp. At this distance, she could plainly see that the two men had just attached five pounds of X4 plastic explosive to a high voltage power relay. Then they concealed their work by bolting a metal sheet over top of it. Saboteurs. Inez had no idea if these were the same men who disabled the Charlemagne or if they belonged to yet another group. Instinctively, Inez filled her lungs to cry out, to raise an alarm. But at the last moment, she quietly exhaled, turned around, and walked off in the opposite direction. In that moment, Inez was fully committed to the runaway plan. She and Cassandra were going to desert the UN. Would it really matter if the Solaris was sabotaged? Perhaps, with luck, this would stop Inez and Cassandra from carrying out their grim task tomorrow. June 30th, 2086. Amadio, Kunbar Star System. The warship Solaris traveled to Amadio by far jumping. The progenitor hyperspace core worked flawlessly, allowing the Solaris to move thousands of light years faster than the blink of an eye. On the bridge, Inez sat in the conduit device, a chair with large metal cuffs on the armrest, and directed her crew from there. 
Around her, the rest of the bridge crew was hard at work. Central Officer Dotsenko and Chief Petty Officer Akbar Siraki coordinated the ship's crew, ensuring Inez's orders were carried out quickly. Rear Admiral Lorenzo Vargas and Scarlett Freeman established communication with the other UN ships in the system. Down below, beneath the Solaris, the savannah world of Amadio glittered like a bronze marble. Warships of the Galactic Defense Force were arrayed in formation, beating back an armada of United Nations warships. Meanwhile, on the ground, 700,000 soldiers of the UN Army were locked in pitched battle against an oncoming horde of nearly two million MyCor battle droids. Cities lay in ruins while the skies were full of starships trying to shoot each other down. Inez took in all of this information and then looked over her shoulder. Scarlett Freeman was standing on the far starboard side of the bridge watching over everything and making sure the plan was carried out. Inez had no choice but to give orders and follow her mother's plan to the letter. Helm, take me into the lowest orbit possible. Admiral, I want every fighter and corvette in the fleet to converge on the Solaris. Defensive tactics, sphere formation. Sphere formation? Central Officer Datsenko replied. Wouldn't wall or claw formation maximize forward firepower? I don't want forward firepower, Inez said. I need layers of armor and shielding. Arrange the strike craft in a multi-layered defensive ring. Rings on rings on rings. Absolutely nothing gets to the Solaris. The cruiser throttled her engines and began to dive, screaming down towards the planet Amadio. The battling fleets scrambled in response. Fighters and corvettes broke away from the UN Navy and assumed their escort roles around the Solaris. The rest of the fleet is undefended! Vice Admiral Vargas called out. Order the carriers and motherships to fall back, Inez commanded. Hopefully the GDF will give chase and lighten the load on us. The Vice Admiral projected his voice to the UN fleet. All ships, this is an emergency directive from Solaris. All super capital ships will retreat. Motherships and carriers, fall back to the staging area at Alpha Centauri. Strike Group 9, peel off and escort them. Knowing the time was near, Inez pushed an intercom button on her armrest. Prometheus Engine, this is the commander, do you hear me? She said. Bring your systems online now. Yes, ma'am, a voice replied. Subject 2 is secure, and we are extracting psionic energy now. 15% capacity and rising. It was time. Inez put each of her hands into the metal cuffs on each side of the conduit device. With a painful clamping, Inez felt a vice-like pressure clamp down on her wrists, followed by a sharp piercing as needles pricked her fingers. Then, after a moment's delay, the full effect of the conduit device kicked in. To Inez, it felt like insanely powerful drugs suddenly took effect. All at once, Inez was hyper-aware of everything around her. She could feel each piece of debris striking the hull. Hear the breathing of everyone aboard Solaris. The straining of the ship's engines felt just like the agony of going for a long run. Suddenly, it dawned on Inez what was happening. She was unbound, a living part of the ship. Something similar was happening to Cassandra down below, and Cassandra's gift was amplifying those feelings. The Solaris was, for the moment, an extension of Inez's physical body. Having gathered her bearings, Inez recommitted the Solaris to its dive. The cruiser was now in the uppermost layers of Amadio's atmosphere, and the GDF was redeploying to block the way. Push forward, Inez shouted. Make my altitude 60,000 meters above sea level. The Divine Enforcer is charged, Central Officer Datsengo reported. We're ready. Commence primary ignition, Inez ordered. Scarlet stepped out of the shadows. You may fire when ready, Scarlet said. 
one final wave of GDF warships rose up to strike the Solaris. Frigates and destroyers turned their weapons against the incoming cruiser. Ion beams, energy cannon blasts, and mass driver rounds all raced toward the Solaris only to hit the protective ring of fighters and corvettes. Rotate the sphere formation, Inez ordered. Keep a layer of strike craft between ourselves and whoever is shooting at us. Just as she gave the order, a squadron of Partogan battle cruisers broke off their pursuit of the retreating human warships. Turning around, these super capital ships bore down on Solaris from behind. Moving swiftly, the escort fighters moved to block the attack, shielding the Solaris and sacrificing themselves to a hailstorm of incoming fire. Inez felt the Divine Enforcer warming up. The sensation was similar to that of the buildup immediately before throwing a knockout punch. Inez took aim, pointing the barrel of the mighty weapon downward toward the planet's surface. For her target, Inez selected the city of Heshmat, an Ahmadi metropolis that was nearly surrounded by human soldiers. Then, just before the crucial moment, Inez felt Cassandra's presence. Somehow, it was as if the two were connected to one another by an unseen force. Inez felt a warm sensation, as though Cassandra had taken her by the hand. Then, there was a mad rush of psionic energy pouring into Inez's body. Her left hand gripped tightly by Cassandra, Inez motioned to raise her right hand, forgetting her limbs were shackled to the conduit device. We have a hyperspace signature, someone called out, directly ahead of us. But Inez was so lost in the moment, enveloped by Cassandra's power, that there was nothing she could have said or done in that moment. Power entered through Inez's left side and exited out her right. And in that one singular moment, everything happened. First, a beam of golden light shot down from the Solaris and hit the surface of the planet. Magnificent light permeated away from the point of impact and filled every nook and cranny, spreading outwards until the entire planet was illuminated like a newborn star. Awe-inspiring god rays shot away from Amadio and into the darkness of space, lighting up everything around in sharp black and white contrast. In the same moment, a series of powerful explosions rocked the Solaris from bow to stern. Great plumes of orange flame shot out of the superstructure. All of the lights went out. The artificial gravity failed, the engines died, and breathable air started venting from dozens of newly punched holes in the hull plating. The vessel was suddenly crippled. But when the bridge lost power, Inez was suddenly able to see through the forward window without the obstruction of holographic displays. She saw the light in the darkness. To her, it took the shape of a yellow angel, hovering in space. The space angel lofted herself upon feathery wings and descended to the planet below. Somewhere in the back of her mind, Inez remembered that she was not the Divine Enforcer's target. She would not be as blessed as the people on the ground. Down below, on the planet Amadio, billions of Amadi people watched in awe as their planet was bathed in warm light. Spreading out from the point of impact, a wave of psionic energy rolled over the world, and every person who was struck by it, be they Amadi, human, or something else, had an overwhelming spiritual experience. An apparition of Jericho visited every human standing on the surface of Amadio, and she personally reassured him or her of their superiority over all living things. Every Amadi had their eyes opened to the truth that their species existed for only one purpose, to serve 
humankind. Finally, every robot, droid, artificial intelligence, and synthetic life form on the planet simply keeled over, instantly slain. Bridge, this is Cannon Control. The Divine Enforcer is offline. Repeat, Divine Enforcer offline. Someone was desperately trying to contact the bridge, but Inez was unable to respond. She was struggling to detach herself from the conduit device. In the moment the weapon fired, Inez felt as though her hands were being burned and started trying to free herself. Central Officer Dotsenko grabbed one of the cuffs and simply smashed it in his own mighty grip. Inez freed herself and was quite happy to see that aside from a few bleeding pinpricks on her fingers, she was not actually injured. Inez tried to move away from the conduit device, but was grabbed by her mother. Well done, Nezzy! Scarlet cheered. Well done! Look what you did! Damage control teams had already restored power to the bridge, and the holographic displays were back in front of the view screen. One by one, Amadi cities and armies were starting to surrender. The GDF fleet had also broken off their attack and many of their own ships were also signaling surrender. The battle was over. But Inez did not care. She gave orders for damage control teams to work on engines and life supports and to dispatch repair corvettes to the rest of the UN fleet. Then, Scarlet said she needed to leave the bridge. I need to send a message to Secretary General Etienne, Scarlet said. The weapon malfunctioned, but still had the intended effect. This is a major step forward. Then Scarlet hugged Inez and said, I don't know why I ever doubted you. As soon as Scarlet left the bridge, Inez gave Dotsenko the con and left as well. She scrambled down seven decks to the Prometheus engine, where Cassandra was. The instant she reached the machine, Inez demanded for Cassandra to be extracted. The crew obliged, and the little girl was carried out on the shoulders of a technician. Cassandra was so badly worn out and exhausted that she could barely hold on to Inez's shoulders. Inez was terrified the girl would be in even worse shape that she walked gingerly down the corridors. Instead of returning Cassandra to the cargo hold, Inez carried her up to the captain's quarters. After all, the ship was under Inez's command. She could let anyone she wanted into that room. It was her room. On her way to her quarters, Inez spotted the same group of saboteurs she had seen earlier. They still had no idea Inez knew about what they had done. The men asked Inez if she wanted them to join the damage control teams. Go to the hangar bay and secure any loose cargo, she said. That should keep them away from life support, Inez told herself. When she reached her quarters, Inez gently laid Cassandra down on her own bed and found the little girl was now completely passed out. Somehow, Cassandra looked even more gaunt and malnourished than before. Cassandra's skin was drawn tightly over her body and her cheekbones stuck out. It was almost as though the Prometheus engine was sapping away Cassandra's very life force and not just her psionic energy. Never again, Inez told herself. This has got to stop. A few hours later, the Higaran pirate ship Ashoka dropped out of hyperspace a short distance away from Amadeo. On her bridge, Himawari was treated to yet another angry outburst from Halimi Haka, furious about a missed opportunity to attack Charlemagne and reclaim the hyperspace core. Charlemagne isn't even here! Hali yelled to anyone who would listen. Damn it, let's spool up the hyperspace module and jump out of here before the humans spot us! Before anyone could respond, Amako, Runhan, and Himawari all pointed at something they had just spotted. Look there, Amako said, pointing at the sensors manager. An escape pod! 
It's broadcasting a GDF recognition signal, Runhan added. We should take it and save whoever is in there, Himawari concluded. Hali very much would have preferred to stage a quick escape, but her wife and friends were quick to shout her down. Reluctantly, Himawari ordered a corvette launch from the Ashoka to bring in the escape pod. Excitedly, Himawari, Chris, Runhan, and Randall boarded an elevator and rode down to the hangar bay. Everyone was hoping the rescued survivor would be able to explain when and why the Battle of Amadeo ended. Almost 500 meters below, the GDF escape pod was brought into the Ashoka's hangar bay by a pair of corvettes and deposited very close to a group of Higaran marines. Keeping their weapons at the low ready, one of the marines knocked on the hatch to see if anyone was inside. A loud squawking was the reply. Sounds like an avian, Runhan said while Randall translated for his ex-wife. On Runhan's order, the escape pod was opened. Inside, there was one person and one machine. The machine was a great big computer that was visibly ancient and also quite awkward in construction. Somebody had struggled to get this thing in here. As soon as the door opened, an avian woman stumbled out. She looked generally battered and her left wing was broken, sticking out at a funny angle. Who are you? Runhan asked. What ship are you from? And what happened here? Why isn't the GDF fighting the humans? Panting, the avian said, My name is Erebic, and if you love your lives, you'll turn the ship around and run. Run now before the humans catch up. They have a powerful new weapon, and I promise you will not survive it. We need to flee 